Okay, I'm showing the top of the hour. Uh, just to explain to everybody, it's a little bit different format tonight. The very first item is a public hearing. It has nothing to do with the select board. So the select board meeting will not convene until following the public hearing. That should be around 7.15. Uh, we're also put at the very beginning of the agenda presentation by road erosion uh, for the road erosion inventory by the LCPC. So we'll allow them to go first to get uh, so they can get out of here. I, I will open the meeting at that time and uh, just see if there's any changes or additions to the agenda and then immediately turn it over. So with that, uh, we'll go into the public hearing. And Brian, who do we have leading this? We've got Amy and Olivia. Okay, I'll turn it over to you guys. Oh. No, there we go. Sorry, Olivia, you should be all set now. Well, hi, everybody. Um, I know I saw you guys about a year ago to talk about the coffee house, and I am back to talk about the coffee house again. Uh, we are looking to do a USDA grant uh, that would allow us to purchase most of the equipment for the coffee house. Uh, we move forward with the block grant. Grant we're working on getting that completed so that we can open up hopefully by the fall of next year. Uh, but we need to get the coffee roaster, the uh, espresso machine, the coffee machine, the ovens, the fridges, all that good stuff. Um, so we applied for a USDA. Uh, projects grant similar to the one that we did for the Jenna's house, uh, the old church there. And this is just an informational meeting. So if anybody had questions, kind of wanted to know more details about it, this is a, a great opportunity to, to do just that. Great. So are you you're looking for questions from the public then? Yeah, anything that they may be wondering about, any updates they might want to have. Uh, we're not looking to do any kind of installation or construction work with this USD grant. It really is just a, here's a list of things we need to be able to open the coffee house and there's the money for it. And we can just turn it around pretty quickly, hopefully, and, and get our stuff in so we can open a little faster and, and have the stuff that we need. Okay. So, uh, questions? Uh, Kyle, go ahead. Great. Um, thank you, Amy. Um, my question, I have two questions. One is, um, uh, do you have someone that's, um, that is spearheading the the sort of the expertise about the coffee shop thing? So someone who is I, I suppose advising about how what equipment you need and and how to pull a good espresso and roast a good bean. I, I'm I'm assuming you do, but I was just curious who that was. Yeah, we've uh, we worked with somebody who's run a lot of coffee houses before. They helped us a lot last winter. Um, they actually traveled to Europe and due to COVID, haven't really traveled back yet. Um, but we were kind of leaning on her for a lot of our, our, our beginning setup and a lot of the stuff that we use for the block grant. Uh, since then, we have been picking a lot of the locals brain, people who write, live in Jeff or, or Johnson and seeing the things that they've kind of recommended for us. There's also a small coffee association that we've been working with as well, who's helped us either find suppliers or different people that we can ask questions of. We're still kind of figuring things out and it's going to be so long till we open it that we're we're not rushing too much but we have been been talking to a lot of people and I can say Olivia and I know a lot about coffee now <laughs> I bet I bet okay that's great if if I can make a recommendation there's an outfit out of Northfield called Carrier Roasters or Carrier Roasting Company and they actually did a pop-up um a pop-up event in the old Wicked Wings building, the old Plum and Main, oh, yeah? um, at least a year ago now, maybe a year and a half ago. And their coffee is amazing. And they also roast. So they have a lot of roasting uh, knowledge. And, and part of what they do is they actually consult and help set up new coffee shops. So, um, and they're, they're just really great people. And um, 
and their product is amazing. So I do, I, I would recommend well, thank them. you. I haven't yeah. heard of them. We will definitely look them up. I know one thing Olivia and I have been kind of keeping our eye out for is finding roasters who could potentially help us get started since we may yes. not have our roasting machine first immediately. Yeah. Somebody who can kind of help us in those first few weeks in between that setup and something else. Um, so, you know, it sounds yeah. like that somebody who knows the area already and might be a good partner and Olivia and I will definitely look into them. So thank you. Yeah, that's exactly what they do. They help people set up and they, um, I think a few of them, the, the, the founders went to um, NVU when it was Johnson State. So they, they have a real, they know, um, they know Johnson. <laughs> so they know Johnson and they have a, they have a, a, a heart string attached to it, which is nice. Um, okay, so thank you for that. And my second question is, um, so with these grants, just because I don't know a lot about them, what happens, so, so let's say you get it, which hopefully you do, and you're able to purchase the equipment, which we hope you do. Um, what happens, God forbid, if the coffee shop doesn't work out, or I don't know, if, if things just don't work out the way that you anticipated, who, who like owns the equipment at the end of the day? Like, do you have to forfeit it? it back or how does that work with these grants we, we own it um and we have to have a about a 10 year understanding that we will be continuously trying to make a coffee shop we are allowed to move the equipment if need be um say the building got hit by a surprise tornado and we needed to move all the equipment we we would still own it we'd still be allowed to restart um they don't really um, they give you the money, but they're not, they're not saying that, oh, well, if you fold in three years, then, you know, it goes back to us. They go based on the usage life of the equipment. And since we're asking for things like blenders and some of the other stuff, a lot of it is going to be useful life within five years. Um, the mm -hmm. fridges and the freezers are going to be 10 years. The coffee, the big espresso coffee machine will be 10 years. And they just assume you're going to move it with you and keep using it. So that's that's the big thing for them is is that you're going to continuously use it. And mm -hmm. from what I have been able to figure out so far, there is no condition that states if you don't use it within so many years, it goes back. I think you have to have it in operation for at least two years, though. That would be the one limit. It's not a very long limit, though. Right, right. OK, cool. So when you say we own it, you mean Jenna's promise, the nonprofit? Uh -huh. Yes. OK. Okay, so not the for-profit part of the, of the, yeah, okay. Okay, thank you, that was my only questions. Best of luck, I hope it works thank out. Thank you, us too. Yes, we desperately want good coffee in this town. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> All right, uh, if there's anybody else, okay, Jessica. So, so out of curiosity, like a lot of federal grants have a match. Does this one have any sort of match requirement uh, that needs to come from the community? Uh, it, it needs to come from Jenna's Promise and it's a 20% a match. Uh, USDA works a little differently than a lot of other programs. So you kind of have to figure that into your overall match when you ask for it. So we've, we are only allowed outside of Northeast Kingdom $50,000. Uh, and then your match on top of it. So we figured that the 20% match to be able to get the full 50,000 would be at about 18 to 19,000. So we actually asked for, I think 68,000 and some change just to make sure we fully get our match and fully get the full extent of the 50,000. All right. Uh, anybody else from the audience, uh, if you don't have a camera, uh, a reminder on the participants tab, there's a button that allows you to raise your hand virtually, and I'll be able to see that and call on you. So uh, does anybody else have any questions? I guess I can take a second uh, to kind of echo what Amy was saying about the town's involvement with this and if there's any cost or anything to the community. Uh, tonight is really the extent of the town's involvement in this grant process that we are helping facilitate a public information hearing, but Jenna's, this is a grant that Jenna's Promise is going out for independent of us. Uh, we support it. We, we appreciate the work that they're doing in our community and the coffee shop that they're bringing to our community, 
So we want to help how we can, but there is no community uh, obligation for this particular grant. Brian, do we have to sign anything as a town, as like a nope. fiscal sponsor or anything like that? No, it's okay. it, we're not even serving as a fiscal agent for this one. It doesn't go through us at all. Okay. I think there's one piece of paperwork that Brian or Eric has to sign that just says, yes, we know that you guys applied to a USDA grant and that is, uh, that's the extent of it pretty much. That's right, Amy, thank you. Yeah, we, we do have to sign off on, we know that this is happening and that this, you know, is something the community supports. Mm -hmm. Will we need a motion at some point in time to do that? Sure. <laughs> no, I, I think, yeah, uh, uh, I, I think we can, we can ask for a motion on that. Um, I'm not seeing anybody else in the audience with questions. Sorry, Brian, can I just ask Amy, do you have um, a timeline? Like, when can we expect good coffee? <laughs> like, any, I know it's hard to pinpoint a date, probably. Um, I, if I had my way, it would be this coming spring, because I would love to get that thing up and going and, and yeah. all of that. But uh, we're hoping that the block grant, all of the paperwork will be through in the next month or so. And that would allow us to start work on the inside. We'll have to wait for the spring to get the addition up just because it's, it's so cold now. Um, and then once that's in, we'll be able to move our equipment in hopefully over the summer, do final touches, painting, things like that. Um, so I'm going to work really, really hard that by September, we have a coffee shop in Johnson that has really nice coffee. <laughs> gonna try hard yeah yeah okay thank you I know it's a lot mm. we'll get there though one day yeah, yeah. Good. all right Got a few more minutes if anybody's got questions I see uh you're working on the house or the roof over there. Is yes, the, histor the historic society gave us the okay to fix the roof because it was leaking. So <laughs> we get to fix the roof, that will be all done and ready to go. So it'll be one less thing that we'll have to worry about before opening, which will be be really nice because you can that'll be done and you can open. And even if you're still working on the outside a little bit, you can still go in. Hmm. It's such a beautiful and prominent building right in our village. and. For you to be rehabilitating is just really um, wonderful for the community. So thank you. Well, we're glad that we're able to do it. And we're glad that we had your help with the block grant to be able to, to do the rehab that it really needs. And we're excited. It's going to be a really nice building when everything's done. And thank you for doing the uh, window lights in the meantime yes. for the holidays. Those, those look great. That wasn't me, but thank you. Yeah. I'll share it with the team. <laughs> okay, we're coming up close. Is, right. is there anyone else, Brian? I'm not seeing anybody. Okay. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to say, Amy or Greg? We're just going to keep plugging along and, and hopefully we'll get ourselves a coffee house and uh, some some more people in here and we're excited and we can't wait for you guys to see what we hopefully open in the fall. Well, perfect. Best of luck to you. Thank you. Okay, I'm taking that this is wrapping up the uh, public hearing. So I would now uh, open the select board meeting. Right. Are there any changes or uh, additions to the agenda as presented? I don't have any. I want to just speak to the week events of the last week when we get to that later on in the meeting. Okay. So if there's no further changes or additions, 
we'll hand it over to uh, who's who's going to do the uh, road erosion inventory report. I'm going to ask Rob to unmute. Hello, Rob. Hello. Hello. So in your board packet, you've got kind of the, the draft report for our road erosion inventory. So it includes the, the raw data that we've seen before and more detailed information about, uh, about the, what all that, that, that raw data means uh, and kind of the, the, how we got to this point, what's outstanding and, um, you know, just kind of all the narrative behind it so that we, we've moved beyond just the uh, simple uh, explanation. It also, we're costing out a couple projects that are uh, areas that we think might, we might be interested in uh, looking at in the next few years. Rob, do you want to lead us with anything or are you looking for questions? Uh, yes, I can give a, a, a quick overview. Um, I think you all recall and, and thank you again for having me on this evening. Um, um, I think you recall that we uh, received a grant to conduct a road erosion inventory, REI, road erosion inventory for the town of Johnson. And that inventory is uh, required by the municipal road general permit, the MRGP. And the MRGP also requires uh, um, conformance with the best management practices for class one, two, three, and four roads. And uh, the different roads have different um, practices that are required to fit the characteristics of those roads. And so uh, we conducted an inventory with a grant from the Agency of Transportation. And um, what that involves is, is the uh, identification of what the state calls hydrologically connected road segments. So a road segment is 100 meters 328 feet and um, hydrologically connected means that uh, the runoff from that road reaches a waterway um, that ultimately is connected to Lake Champlain or the Connecticut River. And so this is related to water quality around Lake Champlain uh, when the rule was set in motion a few years ago. And um, the overall uh, status uh, of the town um, um, was observed in a series of uh, site visits to uh, every single um, mile of every road to verify whether it was jurisdictional to this permit requirement or not. And then if it is jurisdictional, an assessment of the condition related to the best management practices was conducted. And um, it is very important to note that that data is a snapshot in time. Uh, as we talked about last time I was uh, meeting with this group, um, conditions can and do change uh, at a moment's notice and uh, a big storm comes through and, and things get undone. And the reverse happens where the highway department, for example, will conduct a project, which then uh, positively affects the, uh, this, that situation um, that may have been identified in the snapshot. So you have a database that uh, the state has access to, and it is a snapshot in time. So the conditions at a particular location today, it's very possible that they're different than they were when, when the snapshot was taken. 
But none, nonetheless, uh, it's a very good indicator of the overall conditions of the town highway network. And it's a very good indicator of the types of scenarios um, that the town needs to pay attention to over time. Um, and so, uh, some examples of these practices include uh, a nice crown and a gravel road, um, uh, shoulders on a gravel road where the water can run off of the shoulder down into a ditch or either into the forest or a meadow somewhere that it's not going to harm uh, the water if it's carrying sediment. Um, and so there's several practices along those lines that are required. Culverts have their own set of practices and um, as do paved roads with catch basins. And uh, class four roads have a uh, standard uh, regarding um, the presence of erosion that is uh, 12 inches or deeper. And um, the requirement is uh, somewhat simplified, you might say, to uh, reflect the, the, that it is a class four road. And the con primary condition is to fix the erosion. Um, and then you have pretty much any tool in the toolbox that you want to use to do that. So the overall condition of the town um, is uh, a good, good portion, more than half of your road segments um, are not jurisdictional to the permit and more than half of those that are jurisdictional to the permit are in uh, good condition or they were in good condition on the day of the assessment. And so you have less than 50% of your jurisdictional roads that uh, require some kind of work over time. And the period of time is the uh, conclusion of the municipal road general permit that is uh, the year 2036. So um, working towards compliance with the permit uh, by 2036, um, I had had uh, many discussions with um, uh, Brian Krause before he uh, retired and uh, as well as Brian Story to identify um, uh, good example characteristic projects um, that might contain uh, various um, issues that need to be, to be addressed in various circumstances that reflect sort of the randomness of the town's topography and geographic location. Um, so uh, we came up with a, a, a list of, of six years worth of projects and the grand total um, very rough cost estimate for that work is uh, approximately $745,000. And um, the estimates for each site-by-site -site project actually include um, some known capital projects, as well as the costs associated with working towards compliance of the permit. The idea there is for the select board and the town administrator and the highway department to simply have an awareness of when you go to tackle a known capital project or uh, some situation that's, that's uh, something you're planning to work on or construct, um, that while you're there, it's a good idea to make some progress towards compliance with the road permit in the vicinity of the known capital project. So for example, um, on Rocky Road and Hunter Road near the Scribner Bridge, uh, I think it's commonly known that the Scribner Bridge will be uh, you know, receiving some improvements um, related to the Halloween storm and, and flood hazards in general. Um, and uh, so uh, when and if that project is tackled, um, you might as well address, uh, you know, the, the, the road segments in the vicinity of the bridge. So uh, a ballpark, very ballpark project estimate would be $200,000, uh, a, a, 
a vast sum, you know, vast quantity of that is, is for the bridge and the structural work and the mitigation type of activities that you would plan on doing to protect your covered bridge. And that again has nothing to do with complying with the road permit, but um, it, it can include for a relatively small cost uh, addressing some uh, com uh, compliance issues related to the road permit. So uh, in, in the report that's in front of you is an example, uh, a list of example projects and the costs and timelines and project descriptions are subject to change. Um, again, everyone knows that priorities change. Um, things happen we weren't expecting and, uh, and we need to shift gears and react to that accordingly. Um, so this list is not intended to uh, paint the town into a corner or, or uh, commit you in any firm uh, way to, uh, to doing this specific projects and these specific sequence. It's again uh, intended to be, uh, to generate um, uh, and assist with the understanding that over time, uh, every single year between now and 2036, uh, you will be tackling known capital projects. And at the same time, you will be tackling water quality related projects for compliance with the road permit. And um, so with that, uh, you have seen the maps and the data in the past. And again, I do appreciate your time and, and having me come before you again. Uh, I am hoping uh, for the town to accept this report uh, with any further uh, changes that you may tell me directly or you may, uh, Brian, uh, may suggest um, between now and the end of the year. And um, I can go ahead and take the draft stamp off the report and submit it to the grant, uh, the grant agency um, that funded the work. And you will have uh, 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 one item out of a list of compliance uh, issues um, for the road permit uh, taken care of with the fact that uh, this data set, uh, this snapshot of conditions um, related to the best management practices, uh, you have fulfilled that obligation as part of the permit um, before the deadline. So uh, thank you for, for uh, working with me and thank you for your support along the way and thank you for the uh, support of the staff along the way. Uh, I guess at this time, if there's any questions or discussion, I'd be happy to answer questions and um, work further with Brian as uh, needed. Okay, thank you, Rob. And thank you for all the work that was put into that. Uh, I guess, first of all, I'll open it up to the board. Does anybody have any questions? Go ahead, Mike. I just want to thank Robert for the great job. That, uh you and your crew did on this. It's uh, fantastic and I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, this is Doug. I'm wondering on the, uh, this, this uh, REI gets updated every five years. Would it be prudent to have a rolling list of, uh, you know, possible impacts? You know, you, I, I assume that we're things that we're checking off and adding, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, you, you went to great lengths to say this is just a snapshot in time. Um, you know, is, is LCPC out of the picture until five years or whenever the next REI comes along or whoever or whoever does that? What what use would you suggest we do, you know, at, and during that five year period with regard to the list? You know, I know that it seems to me that jurisdictionally we're not changing that list right now. But other than taking things off, but I'm thinking about adding things, you know, should we have an idea what's out there or should we keep a list? Uh, I think I might be able to answer that, Doug, that uh, that that is something that we'll track in between uh, the, the official cycles, but LCPC won't really have a role in that. That'll really be our internal tracking of uh, where we've done projects and where we're, we know there are problems for projects that we have to address in the future. 
you know, so it, it's really kind of in-house and internally that we would uh, develop and use that data. My, my next question is, you know, I understand the cost of capital projects. Are the, uh, you know, is the cost of the MRGP on the town uh, roads likely to exceed the money that we receive for the roads? Is there any, has there been any predictions on whether um, the, the cost of the improvements are sufficiently beneficial to, uh, uh, so that our maintenance will go down, you know? What sort of uh, what sort of increase in cost or decrease should we look for? Um, I'm going to let Rob get in on, on this one, but I do want to point out that we were one of the few towns that was selected and is participating in an effectiveness study on Clay Hill. So the select board, uh, to its credit, we did sign on for a, a study on the effectiveness of the. Uh, mitigation efforts that the state is making us do, and we should be able to collect the data uh, to prove whether it is or is not effective and actually saving us money on this. So, um, yeah, we, we can we should pat ourselves on the back for for having done that because uh, that was not available. Uh, that data was not available at all before, and uh, not very many communities got to participate in those studies. Uh, and that Rob had a huge hand in getting us uh, as a participant. Yeah, that, that's a good, really good point, Brian. Um, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, uh, UVM and VTrans are working uh, on an ongoing research project to assess the efficacy and the um, consideration of cost uh, towards uh, achieving the goals set out for Lake Champlain uh, with these particular um, practices and scenarios that are similar to Clay Hill um, is, is uh, that's where they're starting their, their research project and, and they've acknowledged that they need to peel the onion even further and go even further um, with their research. Um, aside from uh, that, uh, just more generally speaking about costs, uh, many towns have commented to me over time that, um, that uh, and, and Johnson is one of them, that these practices that are put in place, um, not only are they good for water quality, uh, but they actually do help preserve the asset and the infrastructure um, that's under the town's control. Um, if, if the road is um, going to wash out less frequently, for example, um, that's ideally fewer ongoing cost for quick band-aid repairs. Um, that said, to keep these practices functioning to their full efficiency, and this is part of what UVM is looking at, um, it will take ongoing maintenance of these features uh, in a way, um, you know, it will require time of the, of the uh, highway departments to, uh, to, to clean out di ditches and, and catch basins and so on um, so that they continue to perform over time. Um, and I believe part of the Doug's question was also about um, the uh, availability of grants and funding um, maybe related to the, the annual high, highway mileage money received from the state. Um, uh, unfortunately, this is adding to the per mile cost of how much it takes to uh, operate and maintain a road network. Um, and as far as I know, those amounts that are set by the legislature are not increasing. Um, however, there are multiple grant programs that already existed and some new ones that have been established. Uh, some of them are competitive, some of them are less competitive, uh, where the town can participate usually on an 80-20 uh, match, 20% local match. Um, so a $10,000 project in theory would only cost the town $2,000. So you're leveraging your local money that way. Um, 
there's um, various programs out there that can help um, address these issues and work towards progress. But it is a good question of, you know, is, is there enough money to go around and and what is the money um, getting in terms of, um, you know, progress is a, is a good question. And, and I think, uh, stay tuned, that, that answer is to, be, uh, is to be discovered as we all move forward and do our best in complying and, and improving the, the water quality and also at the same time finding these efficiencies for improving your uh, and preserving your your road and highway assets. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. I, I would just uh, add from my uh, looking at your report, the areas that you identified as problem spots uh, in my mind were ones that we were familiar with mostly and uh, it pretty much was in line with what I thought we had for problem spots. I'm glad you did bring up about the uh, the six year plan that was laid out and the, and the close to three quarters of a million dollars, even if you back out the Scribner Bridge and the hopes that we have for mitigation money of paying for most of that project, which is one of the bigger ones, where there's still a, about a little over half a million dollars and uh, for a town the size of Johnson, that's a huge amount of money. Um, and I'm certainly hoping there's going to be a lot more grants available because we would need help completing those projects. Mm -hmm. uh, has anyone else got any questions for Rob? Uh, I think Kyle had her hand up next and then Nat. Okay. Go yeah, ahead, Kyle. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Robert, for all this information. And a lot of the questions I had were, were asked, but I wondered what I just thought of as we were talking, if, if our, um, mud abatement master plan um, ties in at all to this erosion mitigation. Um, I, I don't remember the roads off the top of my head that, that are next up for mud um, abatement, but I just wonder if we could kill one bird with two stones on some of this work. Um, uh, or not, yeah. I, it, it was just something that popped into my head. Yeah, uh, no, that's a great point because I do remember seeing the work that was done along um, French Hill, I believe, in mm -hmm. recent years. Yep, and um, and yes, so uh, yeah. Sim simply put, there there is a relationship there to that work, and an opportunity to to capture efficiencies again with mobilization of contractors for the highway department and so on. Um, uh, the um, uh, the, the situation of a muddy road, which the town is addressing um, from that perspective of the safety and use by the public, um, those techniques and tactics um, will go very, fit very well hand in hand with the techniques and tactics to, to address um, erosion and compliance with these permits. Okay. Okay, good. That's good to know. Thank you. And thank you for your work. Mm -hmm. Matt? Yeah, hey Rob, thanks for all of your work. Um, there's been a recommendation from our uh, town planning commission um, to uh, off class four roads or um, a certain set of class four roads and or turn them into trails, um, which in part would, um, I think release us from the obligation to, to comply with these um, permits. Um, I'm wondering if that's a, is that, are other towns doing that? Is that advisable from your perspective? I mean, it seems like that gets us off the hook for the obligation to maintain them, but the environmental issue isn't resolved at all. That's a that's a fair observation. Yes. Um, so uh, again, many many towns. Um, this is something else that many towns have raised with me: the the idea of uh, you know throwing up a class four road into a, a legal trail status. Um, it's it's a conversation that a lot of towns have 
uh, had over the years, even before this permit. And um, there's all sorts of different factors or, or, or reasons um, that a town might consider doing that. Um, um, in, in those conversations and those considerations, when weighing the considerations, I, I, would, I would agree that this is one more consideration to, to put in the balance, you know, on the, on the scales and see how it weighs out. Um, um, and so, yeah, some, some towns have, have actually um, sort of picked up their pace, so to speak, with um, changing the classifications of some roads. For the most part, they do talk about going in that direction from class four to a legal trail. Uh, very rarely, uh, in fact, I can only think of one situation in our whole county where uh, the town is pondering the idea of going from a class four to a class three. Um, in, in, and again, not just because of this road permit, but it is one of the many factors that's, that's part of the consideration. Um, the um, permit does only apply to class one, two, threes, and fours. So uh, erosion that's noted on um, municipal property that's not a class one, two, three, or four road is not jurisdictional to this permit. Thanks. Thank you, Rob. Is there anyone else? Uh, I, Doug, if you're, you have a question, go ahead, and then I've got a couple members of the public. Okay. I have, uh, have an observation. I, I looked over the report fairly carefully. We have, uh, by my count, 24 class four roads in town. Only three of them have segments that, that have, uh, are, are hydrologically connected and, and, and fall into the does not meet or partially meet. And uh, those are the Cotting Hollow Road with seven segments, Mine Road with two, and the Hoag Road with two. So by, for the most part, our roads do not fall into the sections that uh, would have a financial obligation under, currently fall into, that have a financial obligation under the, uh, that, uh, RGP. Um. Thanks, Doug. That's that's good info. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I should I should add that this is a good point for me to uh, raise that since we're talking about the details, I can raise a detail. Um, some road segments were not able to be assessed by the field crew. Um, and that, hap that would happen for various reasons. Uh, they might encounter a, a locked gate. They might encounter a no trespassing sign um, or the, um, the, the road may no longer be present or it may not be present on the alignment that is mapped. Um, so uh, it was, you know, personal safety of the crew was was important and I always advise them if they're not comfortable um, or if they're uncertain about their safety in proceeding further down a class four road then they should just stop and turn around and make note of it. So there were a handful of locations like that around Johnson um, that we simply actually don't know the current status because they were not visually inspected by the field crew for, you know, one of any given uh, reasons. Um, Reservoir Road uh, is one that is coming to mind where um, the mapped road uh, followed a certain alignment and the visible road on the ground um, went in a different direction. And um, I believe the field crew reported to me that there was actually a gate there. So there was two reasons in that case, that they didn't continue to assess and collect data in that example. One was the alignment was not correct. So they were uncertain if they were trespassing. And then two, the gate um, was a pretty clear indication that if they went on the other side of the gate that they would be trespassing. Um, so, uh, well, I, I agree uh, with that 
uh, assessment that that um, you know most of the roads either aren't jurisdictional or don't have issues. That is true. There's a handful of roads that were not actually assessed, um, class four roads, and I did provide that list at one point to the planning um, commission uh, when when I had met with you folks and them. Um, gosh, several months back over the summer at some point, and we discussed class four roads. Does that list appear in your report generally? Because the planning did, hasn't shared that with us. I did not include that list in the report, no. Um, but that is something that I can uh, forward along to Brian um, so that you all uh, have access to that. Good, thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, we are running a little bit behind schedule, about 15 minutes, but is there anybody from the public who has questions? I've got uh, two members of the public. Okay. All right, uh, Kirsten, I'll call on you first and then Scott, uh, Kim, sorry. So Kirsten, you'll have to unmute yourself. Okay, I see you unmuted, Kirsten. Are you there? I can see you on video, but I can't hear you. How about if we go to Kim and Kristen can try to figure out what's going on? All right. Uh, so I'm going to give you a second. I'm going to go to Kim and then we'll come back to you before we move on to another topic. Okay, Kim, can you unmute? Hey, um, I just wanted to ask Rob if the Champlain Basin Committee that is sort of the, the initiative that is the legislation seems like it came from them. Um, is there anything that distinguishes like little roads up in the boondocks that have a little bit of erosion that then go into another stream, then go into another stream versus, for example, Clay Hill, which goes into a stream directly into the Guyon River. Is there any, um, do they have any distinction? Do they get that there's, there's bigger, chunks, for example, the college parking lot, which doesn't have any anything to do with this study and how much water, oil, salt comes off of that directly into the river? That's a good question. Um, so the permit is very specific that it's related to roads. Okay. Um, and there are other tools um, for example, permits and rules that come into play regarding parking lots and roofs and so on, uh, both public and private property. Um, so those are subject under a, a, a similar related but, but different um, regulatory jurisdiction. Okay. I might try and get in touch with you and just chat about that. <laughs> sure, yeah, okay. happy to. Thank you. So can we get Kristen back? Yeah, let's try again with uh, with Kirsten. All right, Kirsten, I see you're unmuted. No, can't hear you. No, I'm I'm sorry, we can't hear you. No, I, I'm sorry, Kirsten. Um, if you want to, you've got my email address, feel free to email your question and I'll share it with Rob and try and do our best to get an answer back to you. Okay. Uh, with that, there's no other public members, right? I don't see anybody else from the public who had a question. Okay. Thank you, Rob, for coming in and, uh, and for all of the information. And Thank you very much for your time, and um, I would appreciate uh, some sort of note in the in the minutes. Um, whether you conduct a vote or not is totally up to you, but um, a note of some sort to accept the report 
um, pending any further questions or edits that may be directed by Brian to me. And I guess I would look for the board's pleasure here. Do you feel prepared to adopt or accept the uh, uh, proposal or the draft or do you want more information or different, take time to decide? I hope that we accept it using Rob's exact language there. What was it pending small edits between you and Brian or something? How'd you say that, Rob? Um, second. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we've got a motion and a second on the floor to adopt it as draft form presented. Any other discussion? Not seeing any, all those in favor signify saying aye. 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 Those opposed? And the ayes have it. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Rob. Merry Christmas, Christmas. Happy New Year. Yeah. Happy holidays. You too. Happy holidays, everyone. So is the board prepared to approve the meeting minutes of December 7th? So moved. Got a motion, okay. we have a second. We have a second. Any other discussion? Yeah, I just wanted to add that something that wasn't in the notes and, the, and I'm not going to move that we add it, but I'll, it'll be noted in these many uh, meeting minutes, I hope, is that I had also brought up um, when I was talking about uh, some additions to the meeting minutes prior at the joint meeting that um, that Jasmine Uris's, um request to speak was was denied. And I thought that was an, and, and I brought that up as part of my um, discussion last meeting. And I just want that to be noted in, in these meeting minutes. Okay, so noted. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify saying aye. 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 Those opposed? And the ayes have it. Rosemary, I believe you're on. Okay, you have to unmute Rosemary. Okay, there you go. Okay, I don't have much for tonight. Um, you guys got the budget status reports. And we have received our pilot money in the amount of 398,000, which was about 44,000 more than what we budgeted. Right direction. Yes. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> and That's just good news. That's funny though, because those revenues from the uh, um, sales tax must be down. So they really subsidized that with CARES Act money. Well, I'm thinking it's probably going off of last year's sales mm -hmm. tax figures, not the current year. Really? They wouldn't use current year? It trails a bit. I, I don't know to what degree it trails uh, behind act, like current actuals, but... Huh. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do with all that extra money, Mr. Chairman? We'll have a party. <laughs> Anything else, Rosemary? And um, we received our um, land records grant money today. And as of today, we had, there is March of 2000. I mean, 1991 is on the site now. So we got 40 years of records on the site. Good. Good. And uh, I'm assuming that you're not one of the town clerks that's being sued. I didn't know anything about that until I saw it on the news tonight. Oh, good. Oh, we haven't been served. What's that, Eric? I didn't oh, see some attorney from Connecticut is suing a bunch of town clerks for not having access to records and mm -hmm. deeds and everything else. Oh, dear. Yeah. Figures it'd be Connecticut or someplace. <laughs> yeah. Hey, as long as they come up and quarantine for two weeks, we'll let them in. Let them come in, yeah. Thank you. Put them Anything up someplace. Else, no, just to have Eric authorized to sign the warrants. Okay. I'll move. We have a motion. Do we have a second? 
Second. I'll second. I have motion, second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? I'll be in tomorrow. Anybody got any questions for Rosemary? If not, and I believe I saw, thank you, Rosemary. You're welcome. Uh, thank you. I believe I saw Hugh on uh, here somewhere. Yep, there he is. Welcome, Hugh, and for your first uh, report for as a supervisor of public works. And thank you for taking the position. Welcome. Absolutely. Thank you. Welcome, Hugh. I'll Welcome. Appreciate your report that I had nothing to do with. <laughs> yeah, so I'll share uh, the screen for the written report. Um, but yeah, to be fair to Hugh, uh, the this report was written before he arrived. Um, so he was here to present a, a report he didn't write. So this is Jason's, these are Jason's notes. Yes. Okay. No different than most bosses. Yeah. Is there anything out of the ordinary in this? It looks like uh, the, the big thing that I would note is uh, the increased graffiti and vandalism that we're seeing right now. We're seeing kind of unusually high incidents of, of graffiti and vandalism. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not sure what's going on with that. We're going to get in touch with the sheriff's department and uh, keep an eye on it. Any uh, particular areas or just across the community? Pretty well across the community, uh, a lot in the downtown. We had a, quite a few recently along Railroad Street. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and this bridge was a very visible example of this. Yeah, and this is the first time I'm seeing it also on private property. Like, you know, it's yeah, kind of typical to see it on that. bridges, but then to see it also on some private um, wooden fences and things like that is that that feels really new to me. Bob Hoag's building got vandalized too, right? I wasn't aware city. of that, but I thought it looked like there was some on there the other day. Could be. Could be. Do, uh, any of it that I've seen, a lot of it anyhow, has been like symbols and I can't even read it. I don't know what the hell they're talking about, but <laughs> maybe it's my age. Could be your habits. Yeah, I don't know if there's any. I mean, it looks like a lot of it's the same color, so I imagine it's the same person or people. Uh, but no, it doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, I mean, part of the whole graffiti artist MO is to be pretty incognito um, and to have a tag and a, a sort of their own specific look. This, however, just does feel very I think it is the same person, but it feels really random what they're putting on things. Like there's not a consistent sort of tag or or um, feel to the work. It's it just feels it feels, yeah, just kind of spontaneous. Um, and unfortunately, not very interesting. <laughs> otherwise, uh, otherwise, I might support it in in an uh, artistic way. <laughs> but. Um, you're going to check in with the sheriff's office? Yeah, we'll work with them and, and try and keep an eye out on it. Uh, okay. See if we can track any of it down, uh, or at least just let them know that we're seeing a spate of it and for them to keep an eye out. Are we having any issues or problems removing it? Uh, not too much. Uh, the bridge, uh, they would climbed up the bridge, and w the bucket truck from the village isn't hasn't been available for us to use. So we cleaned what we could reach, okay. but we're gonna have to clean more in the spring. Okay. Well, uh, the bridge, we just re we just painted over it. it. It's painted black already. It's not, yeah. that one isn't really worth trying to scrub and save, but on the signs and other things, uh, we've been taking it off. Again, as much as possible, we try and treat things with, uh, 
uh, easy to clean and graf graffiti resistant, like mark resistant uh, top coats. Hmm. Most of the signs come that way. So uh, they clean pretty easily. You got anything else to add, Hugh? Not really. It's been a good past couple of days. I came on board and it immediately started snowing. So. <laughs> Did that take you away from the paperwork to look at the Rotor Royston inventory that, that you were trying to see and review? Yeah, yeah, I've uh, it's been a real nail biter when it comes to prioritizing. But um, yeah, no, it's been good to get out and ride with the guys and uh, start to learn who does what. And it's a it's a good time of year for me to start. I like to jump right in. Perfect. Anybody got any questions for Hugh? I if guess not, I just, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Kyle. Sorry, I just wanted to add one more thing to the graffiti issues. I just wonder, Brian, if we couldn't start looking into just some, I don't know, looking into what other communities are doing that's, that's not just, um, Oh, can you hear me okay? I feel like I'm yeah. all of a sudden. Okay, um, th that other communities are doing to to navigate um, graffiti artists or vandals, however you look at it. Um, you know, as an alternative to just getting the police involved because A, I don't think the police have time for it um, and B, I think it's, it's an ongoing thing. And so if there's creative ways that we can somehow channel that energy into the right places, that would be, that would be of course, best case scenario. I'm sure. not sure what that is, but I just wonder if, if we shouldn't, I don't know. And I'd be willing to also research that a little bit, but. Yeah, it, I, I think we could both look at that a little bit, talk to some other communities and see what they're doing. Um, and yeah, kind of like we said, we think this is, probably one probably one or two people that are very active in this mm -hmm. uh, so yeah if we can divert them onto something more constructive then that would be great mm -hmm. okay thanks Good. yeah we can talk yep. okay uh, uh, with yeah, that yeah is there anything in your report that Hugh would want to stay for uh, we, we've got a question from Nat first oh go ahead Nat sorry hey Couple few things. Uh, welcome, Hugh. Thanks for being here. Um, first question is: Do you have uh, Brian Krause's old phone? I do you have his old phone. Um, phone. <clears throat> I'm not a fan of carrying two phones. I've forwarded the town number to my personal cell phone. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, so, I'm, but I'm available. The same as Brian on that same number. Great, and you're checking, uh, you have access to that town highway foreman uh, email address. Mm -hmm. Is that how we get in touch with you? Great. Yeah. A um, couple things uh, I want to mention, actually, I'll just skip one of them because it's not so, so relevant, but I um, uh, just wanted to make you aware that um, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, a group in town got together to um, make a, a EAB uh, preparedness plan, uh, Emerald Ash Borer preparedness plan. We have somewhere on the order of 2,500 ash trees in our highway right of ways, rights of way. Which one is it? Um, and, um, you know, the, the Emerald Ash Borer, I think is as far north as Cabot, Vermont now. I think, well, it's actually in the islands. It's all around us. It hasn't been detected mm -hmm. in Lamoille County yet, but either here or gonna be here soon. Um, so uh, some night when you're um, having a hard time uh, falling asleep, I encourage you to pull up that EAB preparedness uh, report and just get some familiar with it um, because I think we're gonna, a major issue for highways in the next um, few years will be removal of ash trees. Sure, I'm pretty familiar with it now. Just between the our, my personal forester and I um, for land that we have as a family in current use, um, just discussing it. But awesome. uh, it's, yeah. Awesome, good, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
uh, with that, if you have nothing in your report that you would want to be part of? No, I don't think there's anything. You know, we're going to talk a little, we're going to talk very briefly about the annual certificate of highway mileage, uh, but that's mostly that we have no changes to the certificate of highway mileage. So, yeah, I don't think there's anything that you would be interested in uh, coming up. Well, Hugh, you're always welcome to stay, but don't feel like you have to. I'm going to go to bed. I, I love everybody, but uh, I'm going to go to sleep. <laughs> don't blame you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Okay, Brian, first item up is the town meeting planning. Yeah, so uh, let's see, Act 162 passed uh, at the end of the last session. Uh, gives us some options for a uh, town meeting and how to conduct town meeting. Uh, mostly what it allows us to do is we can temporarily opt into an uh, Australian ballot for one year without a town vote on opting in about using Australian ballot. Uh, it would be temporary only. It would not be, it could not be binding for future years. Uh, we would have to, in order to make it permanent, we would have to go through the whole regular process. Um, so this is just a one year option. There are some other discussions about uh, possible changes about possibly letting us delay town meeting till later uh, when weather might be better or, or the vaccine might be more available. Um, but those have not been voted on yet and uh, it does not look like session's going to start early, so those are not going to be voted on for uh, a while. Um, both Rosemary and myself, uh, I think, would recommend that we make a decision about how we're going to do town meeting sooner rather than later, rather than waiting for uh, whatever changes they might make. Um, they, they have not been, they have not come as quickly as uh, we might like if we were going to make, if we were going to look at other changes. So uh, I think the option that we should settle on is uh, either Australian ballot or conducting town meeting virtually uh, via Zoom. So let me poll the board members. What are your thoughts? So uh, start with you, Doug. Australian ballot. Nat. Um, that Australian ballot would be the least bad option. Kyle? Um, so Brian, are you saying that we, if we had a virtual Zoom town meeting, we would actually conduct floor votes that way? We could try to. I think that would be, that would be very difficult to run, but it is an option for us. Okay, my, I mean, I, I agree Australian ballot is, is the safest and best way, I think, but what I'm, what I'm lamenting about is giving up the back and forth dialogue that happens at a regular town meeting. And I'm just wondering how we can keep that piece uh alive and well going forward and also i mean i we've seen that there's increased participation with zoom select board meetings trustee meetings and even in the summer when we had you know the town the community meetings and i'm just wondering if we couldn't use that to our advantage you know um with a virtual town meeting we will still have to conduct an informational meeting which would presumably be co conducted electronically. Um, so, but that we still, we can't really do floor votes from that because the votes are gonna happen by ballot and the informational meeting, it, it just, it doesn't line up. We can't do an informational meeting before we've written ballots. Mm -hmm. But at the informational meeting, can there be a, a, a dialogue of sorts? I mean, can there be a little bit of a, a... What, I mean, a Q and A, basically. There can be a Q and A. It's just you can't make any changes to the the ballot that's been mailed out. Right. The articles. Right. 
And but you bring up a good point that uh, our articles would have to be reworded a little bit because uh, some of them ask the voters uh, if they're going to give compensation to the officers, for example, and how much that is. Mm -hmm. Well, we wouldn't be able to ask that question. It would have to be, uh, will the uh, voters authorize a specific sum or authorize the board to set its own uh, rates of compensation? So the, all the articles will have to be worded in that fashion of a, it's, a, it's all going to be a simple yes or no. There's no room for debate like you were getting to. Yeah, yeah, shoot. That's the beauty of town meeting, you know. Um, Mike, yeah. what are your thoughts? Well, first off, I'd like to know how long we can delay it if we decided to do that. That hasn't been passed yet. It's okay. an option that they're discussing, um, but they haven't passed it yet. So if we wait, we could end up waiting and they could end up deciding that they're not gonna pass it. Yeah. Well, I, I would move that we would wait uh, to find out uh, what they're gonna do. And uh, my, my second follow-up, uh, would this be a blank, uh, a bulk mailing like it was during the presidential uh, election or would it be a request for a absentee ballot? It, it would uh, have to be, well, I don't know. Do we, do we know how this uh, uh, statute was written? Do we have to mail out? leave that up to the towns. Okay. If we wanted to send it to everybody, we could. I believe we could, but they wouldn't pay for it. We wouldn't okay. receive any assistance for it. Their well, if I have... intention is for it to go by request only. Okay. Well, I'll go back to what I first said that uh, I would prefer to wait a little while uh, to see what kind of leeway the state will come up with. Because I would like to try to have a, a town meeting myself uh, where everybody gets to see each other. And, and uh, I think the uh, a virtual meeting, if you had 500 people show up, I, I think it would be kind of a nightmare to try to manage that. And we would have to go ahead and, and pay considerably more because we, we only pay for a Zoom meeting for like about a hundred people right about now, correct? Uh, no, the, because of the way the steps work, okay. I think we pay for about 500 people. Okay, good. Uh, okay. But it's, there wasn't anything in between that we could uh, take. Matt? So I, uh, Definitely hear what you're saying, Mike, and, and definitely hear what Kyle's saying. You know that that I, I really uh, feel there's a, a, a lot of value in having that old fashioned traditional town meeting. The problem with the delaying it is that we have three months between the time of town meeting, as it is, and the town that time that we need a new budget. Um, so if, if it were to be voted down we would have to go through the process of crafting a new budget um, and then and then holding another meeting. And I, I just, I'd prefer to have the time. Um, I, I don't see even by June, late June, that there's any real um, probability that the general population is gonna be vaccinated based on what I'm seeing. Um, I'm not, I'm no expert. I know nothing more than any, anyone else here on the subject, but um, I, and to, to, to de depend on the Vermont state legislature, God bless them, to, 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 to assume that they're going to do this uh, in a timely way, I think is, is uh, not safe. It's not a safe assumption. So that's why I'm thinking that we shouldn't delay it. And I'm going to, um, to Nat's point, uh, I'm afraid probably we're not going to know much more than we know tonight if we waited this a little longer. Uh, the legislature does not come back in session until the beginning, beginning of January. Uh, any change or any thing that might come out of there is first going to have to go through one chamber and then go through the other chamber, be approved by both, and then have the governor's signature. And we're going to be bucking up against the, a hard stop uh, in late January on uh, getting stuff out. 
So if we went with our regular town meeting, so, so I'm, I guess I would encourage that maybe the board comes to a decision tonight, uh, noting we don't have to, but I don't think we're gonna have a lot more information if we wait. Mm -hmm. We've got till the 25th of January to get all this stuff sugared off or our budget and everything else, correct? That's when yes. we have to, that's our deadline yes. uh, to get that into the town report. Uh, we, as far as getting a budget together, we could, we could have several meetings in a row to get it straightened out. I, I don't think it's going to crowd us that much. I, I don't see what hurt it would be to maybe wait a couple of weeks uh, to see what's going to happen. And we certainly can. I'm just saying I don't believe we'll have much more information than we have right now. Well, that's true, but we might. Uh, so if we take a vote tonight, uh, we're kind of boxed into it, aren't we? No, no, we won't. we won't know anything in two weeks because the legislature won't have even met by then. I thought you said they were going to meet the first of the year. Yeah, in two weeks, we will be coming back and they won't even have gotten together and elected their uh, uh, speaker and that sort of stuff, the formalities that they go through. Probably the first day of their session would be the fourth, two weeks okay. from today. Two weeks from today. Well, go three weeks then. Give them three weeks. You think <laughs> you have an awful lot of faith in government all of a sudden that they can be that efficient to, to pass this thing. Well, to tell you the truth, I don't really, but hope springs eternal, you know. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Do we have any idea what other communities are doing, Brian? Do you have a pulse on what Morseville's doing, Hyde Park's doing? Uh, I don't have a list, but most, several other communities in uh, Lamar County, I know Stowe, uh, and a couple others ha have opted into uh, Australian ballot already. Yeah. I believe Cambridge has also. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I don't think we're the last ones who haven't made a decision, mm -hmm. but most have, most were, had the question up in their well, all of them had the question up on their December meetings and uh, the administrators that I talked to were anticipating that they were probably going to Australian ballot. I thought Morrisville was going to Australian too. I think they are. I know that they expected to. I don't recall if they've had their vote yet or not. Do mm -hmm. you have any public uh, comment? Yeah, I was just gonna ask, is there anyone in the public that would like to comment? Uh, I do have one right now with uh, Walter. Okay, Walter, I'm unmuting you. Go ahead, Walter. Evening, everybody. Thanks for letting me speak. Um, I've already heard a few of you say you like the tradition of town meeting, and so do I. Um, but with COVID this year, I think we all have to adapt and do something different. Um, the one thing I strongly want to urge you to do, and Mike touched on it really quickly, was I strongly think you ought to send ballots to all the voters of Johnson, just like happened in the November election. Um, we had record turnouts for the November election. And I think this is, we've always talked year in and year out about participation. I think this is a chance to have a very good experiment, send, the ballots to all the citizens of Johnson and let's see what happens. Let's see if we can revive some participation, get some interest back into the process. And so while I don't necessarily like the idea of Australian ballot, I think we have to do it this year. And then if we're gonna do it, I think let's try to do it right. And let's try to send everybody a ballot in advance and let them vote and let's see what the turnout is. Thank you, Walter. Thanks, Walter. Howard wants to speak. Howard? Let's Howard speak. All right, Howard, go ahead and unmute. Okay. Long uh, enough. Am I out? Am I alive now? Okay. Yeah, we are uh, on. I know, I just wanted to say, Walter, it's a great idea. Uh, yeah, I think it's a great idea. There you go. That's all I got. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Howard. Is there anyone else, Howard? Uh, Brian? Uh, I don't see anybody else in the public. Again, 
Uh, if you've got video, you can raise your hand or there's the button under the participants tab. You can click to virtually raise your hand. Mike, go ahead. I wouldn't say it was a real record turnout. The, the vote really wasn't a whole lot more than it was really during the general election of 2016. There were still 600 ballots, I believe, that were not turned back in. I think if anybody really, uh, to, to save the town money probably, it'd be cheaper for people to request a ballot or show up in person to vote like we did during the presidential and the gubernatorial election. So I, I don't necessarily think we need to send 2,200 ballots out I with all the postage and return postage. Hearing what uh, Rosemary said about the extra 44,000, I think we certainly can uh, ask the public to please vote however they feel on these issues. 44,000 or 4,400? I think it was 44,000. You're talking pilot. about that extra pilot money. Yeah. Oh, the pilot money. Sorry. Okay. Well, yeah. the election yeah. the ballot does not cost $44,000. No. Okay. I know. I know. Sorry. But he's saying because we had a windfall that, that we can go ahead and, and uh, be right. a bunch of spendthrifts with it. <laughs> I think you could be a spendthrift investing in democracy. Well, you have democracy by people asking for an absentee ballot or showing up in person. Well, let's 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 do first things first. If I may be so sorry, assertive. Uh, the topic is if we go to Australian ballot or not, and then we can we can go to will we send the ballot to everybody or not? Because if we're not going to go Australian ballot, this is just a waste of discussion. Good point. Are you making a motion? Uh, we, I, I'm happy to make a motion that um, we. Uh, forgo traditional town meeting this year um, in favor of uh, Australian ballot and that we have uh, at least uh, one, at least one informational, uh, at least two informational meetings. I'll go with that um, in preparation um, to the, to the, to the uh, March, whatever uh, vote. I second that. We got a motion, we got a second, and I believe the law requires us to have at least one informational meeting anyhow. Yeah. Uh, is there any other what discussion? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think if we could if we could pull off two, that would be great. Cause you know, there's just times and days people can't make, but they might be able to make the the next. So yeah. thank you. The budget, the budget process will be interesting too, because we'll uh, yeah. presumably, you know, usually it's the five, six of us six of us in, in a little room. Uh, and uh, right. now it's it's gonna be two dozen of our, our good friends. Yeah, it's gonna be challenging doing the budget. Yeah. Uh, is there anyone else? Is there anything else they wanna add? Uh, I do, I did have another member of the public. I'm, uh, I, Beth, uh, I'm assuming that you would still have a comment if we've got the opportunity. You can unmute Beth. Sure, what the heck? Um, no, I really was lowering my hand. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I never know if people are lowering their hand or just getting frustrated and clicking a button. I understand. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, I'm all for the Australian ballot. I'm all for the informational session uh, sessions. It is unfortunate that we can't uh, propose changes, but it is what it is. Uh, the other thing that I would just say, Eric, you were talking about language for some of the um, items such as officer pay. Um, I would just recommend that the language refer to um, whenever possible what was voted on last year. So somehow say um, the vote is to carry forward with the 2020 fiscal year, um, whatever the approved item was, um, and carry it forward that way. That that in that manner, that way folks know that it's something that the town's people already voted on. Yep. My two cents, thanks. Thank you, Beth. Thanks, Beth. Is there any further discussion? Uh, I'll throw out there as long as we're talking about how to construct the ballot. Uh, I attended a seminar uh, that the League of Cities and Towns was holding for towns that have not used Australian ballot before. And one of the recommendations for towns that 
are not familiar with Australian ballot is to have our ballot reviewed by the town's attorney. Okay. Any other discussion? More legal fees. Being none, all those in favor signify saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. Okay, we'll do a roll call. Nat, how do you vote? Yes. Doug, how do you vote? Aye. Kyle, how do you vote? Aye. And Mike, how do you vote? Nay. The ayes have it. The motion passes. We will do an Australian ballot for town meeting day. Okay, next topic up, sort of along those same lines, accommodations for petitioners. Yep. So the, uh, as part of Act 162, uh, they changed the petition requirements for candidates seeking office, that a candidate to be elected to town office uh, for one of the positions that's up, uh, they only need to file a consent form. Uh, they do not need to collect signatures. Act 162 does not affect the requirements of uh, collecting regular petitions. Uh, and they leave that up to the select boards of how does the board want to handle uh, collection of signatures for petitions other than candidates. Uh, so that, that's a question before the select board. Do we want to make any accommodations to that procedure? As you all know, the select board has the uh, ability to put articles on the warning at our own discretion without uh, having a petition raised. And, you know, it's a little bit of a, a double-edged sword. Uh, you could have very frivolous petitions submitted uh, with, that would not normally uh, get, uh, be able to get the number of signatures. Um, and yet at the other hand, uh, we probably don't want people out going door to door soliciting uh, signatures either. Mm. And this would also probably apply if the board so wishes to all of our nonprofits, uh, they can simply provide a uh, request to us for increasing their allotment. Mm. Um, typically when they've done that in the past, we required them to go get the necessary signatures or any new nonprofit that we currently don't have uh, in our budget could now just simply provide us with a request to be, you know, so much of the town's money be allocated to whoever they may be. Uh, it's a very easy process if we don't require signatures. And yet, like I said, on the other side of the coin, uh, do we really want them going door to door soliciting signatures? Mm -hmm. That's where we are. How many signatures are needed to get on the ballot? Uh, I'm gonna 50? ask Rosemary for a, a quote on that. 125 or 35. Oh, is it that many? Yeah, it's 125. Okay. I've done it a few times. <laughs> yes. I wonder if we could not, if we could waive the signatures, but still require a little bit of a um, screening process of some sort. Like if, if folks who want to petition, bring it before the board, and if it feels super way off we can i don't know if we could still have a little bit of a selection process i don't know we, if I can wait on that, you can to a limited degree right okay you we're on firm footing to say that's irrelevant that's not town business mm -hmm. but if it's, it's town business it's going to be really hard to distinguish Town, good town business from bad town business, something that we do want and something that we don't want. Mm -hmm. uh, like that gets into judgment calls and that could be prejudicial. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we're on much less firm ground 
if it pertains to town business. Okay. If so, somebody brings in a petition of some, like Brian said, you know, they want to impeach the president. That's something that's not within our power or the community's power. We could reject that. If somebody came in with a petition and said, uh, uh, I want to cut the highway department by half because that is in with their power, that could actually go forward. Well, if that's a new president coming up, you might find some people who want to do that. Uh, we still can't do it. That's not our. Yeah, I know. I know. It's sort of, if yeah. Brian's point, if we open the Pandora's box, but I don't see what choice we got. Yeah, I'm a real mixed mind on it. I think that petition process is really um, useful and, and productive for everybody. And I, I, I wonder if there is an alternative either, you know, would we elect, would we allow uh, some sort of electronic ballot uh, petition process? Um, which would be hard to, to validate people's signatures that way, I think, or maybe a, a postcard campaign. That seems a little, it would be nice to have, yeah. have Brian, do we have, process. go ahead, Nat. No, I'm just having a hard time letting go of this petition process, even though. Yeah. yeah. It, is, is it hard to do an electronic one? I mean, where someone has to actually log in with their own email and I mean, you know, there must be something out there, isn't there? Not that we can easily tie back to a physical address and, and a real person. Um, yeah, we can ask them to sign it. We can ask them to input their address, but it, yeah, it, would, it wouldn't be very hard to fake. Hmm. It's not terribly likely, but it, it's not, it wouldn't be hard to fake. Could we hold a meeting on Zoom that where people who want to petition and put, present something, present it, and they, we ask them to have 10 voters of Johnson participate and agree that it be allowed on Zoom? You know, is there some way of, of mm -hmm. getting some sort of validation that way? Mm -hmm. 10 it has not come to 125. And and one wouldn't expect it to. Of course it has to. That's what the deal is. That's probably one of those things the legislature might take up, but it probably would not be in time for when we got to have our petition. See, if we just waited, we could have got two birds and one stone. The petition deadline is the 14th of January for money okay. petitions. Yeah, okay. I know people are out there collecting signatures for various things at the moment. Um, Would you say that? I've heard of at least two different people who are um, actively soliciting signatures at the moment for various ballot initiatives. Can we hear from the public? I'm I'm just so I'm just very curious to what. Yeah. So uh, I've got a couple people in order. I've got Walter up first. All right, go ahead, Walter. Thank you. Well, first, I'll remind you, you didn't finish the last issue where you decide to mail the ballots or not. So hopefully you go back to that. Um, I think you ought to allow electronic petitions, the full 125. I, and don't underestimate the intelligence of the voters. Um, I think if you allow people to gather electronic signatures, I don't think it is that difficult to, if you did want to check them, to check them to make sure they are valid and let them go forward. And the voters will quickly determine whether something is a valid, valid action item or not. Um, they let the voters decide. Um, and I think you need to let them get on the ballot and Again, we're in these COVID times and to ask somebody to stand outside Sterling Market and confront people to get 125 signatures is unrealistic. But I don't think you need to, you shouldn't squelch democracy. Um, another place I'm dealing with, there's a lot of online tools, I petition, et cetera, et cetera, that you can 
set, somebody could set up very quickly, sit very easily, and then solicit people to get signatures. So it, it can be done. You can request all the information that you need. Um, and therefore you have a small check feature to at least get the, the realistically valid petitions on the ballot. And then you just let the voters decide. Mm -hmm. So I think you ought to go forward with the electronic. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Walter. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yep, I've got a couple more. I've got uh, Beth up next. Um, so I actually usually am all for technology. In this case, I'm not. Um, I think that there are plenty of hackers out there that we've heard of hacking into Zooms. Um, hacking in bots that they're creating <laughs> to buy up all the PS5s if you guys are following the video game generation. So I actually think that um, electronic signatures is not a great method unless you're using a verified software that not everyone can have, has or knows how to use. So that's my two cents on that one. Um, in terms of other ideas. I actually really like Doug's idea. I think that um, having somebody speak for you and recommend what it, whatever it is that you're trying to get on the ballot um, is the right way to go. If you can show that you have multiple people who are known residents or maybe even unknown residents but can prove their residency, um, they should be able to bring a handful of people. You don't want 10. That might be too many to speak. Um, or Maybe they're just raising their hand. I don't know, but I do think you should have somebody vouch for you in some way. Um, I also agree with Walter that whoever petitions to get something on something on the ballot and does it, whether they, you know, however they get the petition signed or whatever you guys decide on for getting um, submitting a petition, uh, I do think that if it is a five-page ballot, so be it. People are going to get bored. As long as the town's business is front and center, those are the things that are going to get voted on first. And if there's a list of 100 items to vote on, well, you know, people will not vote on all of them. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, Beth. Beth. Uh, sorry. Beth Jen. Oh, sorry, Kyle, go ahead. Sorry, Beth, I just have a follow-up question. I mean, do you, do you really think for a little town of Johnson that we'll have a bunch of hackers? <laughs> I don't I know. think that, no, I don't think it's about the town of Johnson. I think it's about any, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter about little town of Johnson. If it's a hacker or a random person, it could be somebody who doesn't want, um, I don't know, doesn't want Joe Schmo to win something. Who knows if they write a little bit of code. Heck, I could write a little bit of code. There's plenty of opportunities and tools available that are really easy and I'm not a developer, by the way. When I say I'll write code, I'm not a developer. But there are kids um, coding websites out there where you can create a simple bot that just loops. And it can do the, I verify I'm a person. Um, and particularly if you're filling out your name and your address, like that's easy. You're just indexing a file that has a bunch of addresses on it that can be pulled from anywhere. Um, so I, I just... You're right. I think the probability is probably low, but what happens if it does? Like if somebody does hack in and you do have that happening, then what, right? <laughs> then you're like, uh, we have the same IP address or we have 20 IP addresses that are all the same and then in a different 20 and then a different 20, what are we gonna do? You don't wanna be put in that situation. Anyway, it's your call, but my two cents. I think okay. what we might do in that situation is do some spot, spot checking and just call a few people on the list to see if they've signed it or not. Sorry to have chunked in. It wasn't my turn. Thank you, Beth. I think Scott would like to. I think uh, I've got a couple Burton. people in front of Scott. So Scott, I see. Oh, okay. I, I will get to you. Uh, but I've got Jen Burton up next. Okay. So Jen. I just wanted to suggest Google Doc, uh, not Google Docs, Google Forms, because it collects email addresses. You can, there's a setting where it'll collect email addresses. And then I was going to suggest what Nat said, which was then do a little, you know, 
choose 5% or 10% of the people, send them an email and say, did you really vote this way or give them a call or whatever, but do some kind of check mm -hmm. to see that it's um, generally valid. But Google Forms would be super easy and is pretty trustworthy and will collect email addresses. That's it. Good to Thank know. you, Jen. Thanks, Jen. Thank uh, and then I've got uh, Scott and then Kirsten. Kirsten. Okay, Scott, you'll have to unmute and... Yep. Great. Um, thanks for letting me speak. Um, I just want to echo Beth's comments. I think they're spot on. Um, and we also have a lot of elderly people and other folks in town who are not engaged with technology and if we get too far down the road with electronic um, filing, they're left out. And I think that's uh, not really okay that we have to make sure that they're counted and are able to um, have input in some form or fashion. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. Thanks. And Kirsten, let's... Uh... Unmute and we'll, we'll try and see if the microphone's working. Brian, just so you know, it's Kirsten. Kirsten, thank, thank you. you. All right, Kirsten, if you can unmute. Okay, I'm unmuted. Can you hear oh, wow. me? Wow, we, yeah, we got you. <laughs> okay, amazing. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I think it's, I don't really think it's fair to have people to collect 125 electronic votes because not everyone uses email and internet and it's a lot easier to contact people in person. And um I just, I like the idea that if a person gets a group of people behind to back, to back and support them with their petition question that um, if the select board could agree on some parameters to, um, that could be in place if they want to decide if it's a good idea to have this come to town meeting or not. Um, I also agree with the person who said that some people don't use internet. So that's really a big issue. I think it could um, cause a lot of loss in voice from our community. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right, uh, that's further? everybody I've got from the public. Is the board prepared to... Uh, make any decision on this tonight? We sort of need to do this soon. Yeah. Is, is it possible to have both options just for people that are tech savvy and then people who, who are not? I don't know. How do you mean? Well, I guess if somebody wants to petition and can get 125 electronic signatures, then that's valid. And if there's someone who feels like their base is not as electronically savvy, then they would, um, they could either, I guess, do it the more, the traditional way or, well, I guess they couldn't bring them to a Zoom meeting if they're not technologies. I don't know, I'm trying to figure out how, how this could work for both, both parts of our population. I think it'd be a lot cleaner if we just decided to pass on the requirement for any signatures mm -hmm. and just I just hope that it's good stuff yeah yeah and let the wisdom of the voters yeah make it what it is yeah i would move that actually eric a motion do we have a second I'll second that. Got a second. Any more discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor signify saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. 
Okay, we'll go by roll call. Mike, how do you vote? Hey. Kyle, how do you vote? Yes. Nat, how do you vote? Yes. Doug, how do you vote? Yes. The ayes have it. We will have a allow petitions with no signatures. Yep. So <laughs> folks watching uh, and following this, I'll remind you that that did not change the date that petitions have to be submitted by. Uh, so please submit your petition to uh, the town hall by January 14th. Matt? The person making the, submitting that request does have to be known, right? They'd have to. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All the, the only change we made was the number of signatures required went from 125 to, to none. Yeah. Okay. But Sounds you still have to submit a formal request and a formal petition, and the date is still the same. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Nat, to go to, with your motion about the Australian ballot, was back to Walter's point, was that, um, did you mean mail out ballots? No, that, that's just still unresolved. Okay. Do, should we should we go back to that, Eric, or what? If what do you the want board's to prepared. It's not something we have to decide tonight, but if okay. the board's pleasure is to decide. Yeah, the legislature needs to act on that before you can vote on that. Okay. Currently, it's not allowed. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Wow. Here. Thank you, okay. Rosemary. Thank you. Okay. Uh, final agreement for the Trailhead Welcome Center. Yep. So the, uh, let's see, the, the, the document for the improvements to the trail, what we had started with a process calling a trailhead and through negotiations, we're now calling uh, the Welcome Center. We're calling it the, uh, help me out, Doug, uh, the gentleman's name. Ted Alexander. We're, we're now calling the Ted Alexander Welcome Center. Um, that is, uh, all of the board's requests have been met and it's available for signing. Uh, the document is in your packet. I've got a couple of the drawings and things that the public might not have seen uh, that came up during uh, final negotiations. So um, it's kind of the opportunity for the board to make their final decision on voting on uh, the Welcome Center and to answer public questions if we have any. Can you do screen sharing of the designs? Yep. And Howard gets to speak. Okay, go ahead and unmute Howard. Thank you. Okay, I just wanted to be able to connect, that's all. So if okay. you leave me with unmuted, that would be good. Sure. So here we've got the, uh, the view from the east elevation. And this is uh, the, the big change. This will be the new trailhead building. Uh, and this is kind of the, the best presentation of it. I've got a couple other design documents here with the viewed from the south and an overhead view. So what this is going to look like is taking our current trailhead building and kind of expanding out in every direction, but especially parallel to the uh, rail trail. Um, and we're going to have more space covered for uh, benches and picnic tables. Uh, we're going to be installing um, some uh, display areas for the historical society. We're talking about uh, public art for the facility as well. Um, 
it's going to involve clearing a lot of the a lot more of that opening instead of having a narrow opening through the brush to the trailhead building will be expanding that opening quite a bit. Uh, I've got maps for that as well. Uh, where we're really expanding on the uh, the visibility. So it'll, it'll provide a greater visibility for the trailhead building. The trailhead building itself will be more noticeable and it will provide a greater view of our um, of our facility. Mm -hmm. We are being provided with uh, in exchange for naming this the, the Ted Alexander Welcome Center, uh, we are being provided with $45,000 to complete the construction, which we believe is the, uh, once we do some matching and in-kind contribution from the town uh, for a little bit of the labor, it is going to uh, pay for the, the project. Um, let me say a couple of things, if I may. Go ahead. Um, on the uh, quarter, on the floor plan that you showed, I guess that was a drawing before this one. Um, that it shows a uh, you know a full ADA compliant restroom. We are not going to build that. Uh, we're not going to do that exactly. We're going to end up putting a uh, an ADA compliant um, uh, portal head in there. Um, we'll probably rough rough plumb for the fixtures as I've shown them there, but we're not going to install them there at this time, um, and like that. So that so that, so Mike, Mike, your concern and and Walters in the past about maintenance of a uh, of a, a, a genuine lavatory facility is is moot. It's not going to happen in this at this point. Uh, what else did I want to say? Oh yeah, so I was just while you while I was sitting here and you guys were discussing your various things, um, I started to try to figure out the sign that would welcome the the population. Um, <clears throat> and uh, what I'm coming up with is this Ted Alexander Rail Trail uh, Welcome Center, uh, Johnson, Vermont. Um, that's subject to uh, approval by others, but um, it ends up being a lot of words on a sign. But that's okay; it'll be a big sign. That's all I got for the moment. Howard, right now, um, I think it says, welcome to Johnson or something. There's Johnson involved somewhere. <laughs> yeah, there is, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so I'm, I, I, I actually love the change to welcome center because mm -hmm. I think it is more welcoming. <laughs> um, right. But, Will it say Johnson anywhere? I, I just sort of feel like that's really important for people uh, that are traveling far distances on the rail trail to know what town they're in. Yes, yes. I mean, yes, oh, I I'm just sorry. The oh, rail. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's there. Okay. It will certainly be Johnson. It may be, it may be a, 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 a separate sign. And, you know, we actually have um, one of the signs um, that, was, uh, that, it was, that it was on the rail trail. I found it in the brush in the, in the mid '80s, and mm -hmm. saved it and gave it to the historical society when they when you know when it came to life again. Um, so we've got it, and whether we use that one or we just duplicate it um, is you know for discussion of another time. Okay. But but we we have we have the original, so we can make it look kind of authentic. I suppose. Okay. okay. Sorry, I missed that point. I, I just that's okay. It. Yeah. Okay. Cool. My thought in, and in the conversations I've had with Deb Alexander was that on the, uh, um, basically the Jeffersonville side, as you approach it, it would mm -hmm. be Ted Alexander Welcome Center. But if you get up and you're in front of the, uh, the what, what projects towards the, uh, towards the ball fields and towards the rail trail, on the rail trail side, it would say Johnson. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Great. Well, it might say Johnson, it could say, for instance, Johnson Welcome Center, but or something like that. But yeah, that would be great. I, I didn't know that, Doug. That's The other question I have <laughs> for all the women out there, who will be uh, 
restocking toilet paper in the bathroom. Well, it's it's a, the the rental uh, the rental company and you know Mad Dog or whatever whoever they are or Hardigan. Well, I guess they're no longer around, but um, <clears throat> they're responsible for that. Uh, you know, I, the fact of the matter is, I think that they that they supply one or two rolls of TP between their scheduled cleanings. So it would behoove us to buy a kit, go to have somebody at a Costco or somewhere and get and get a couple of cases of the stuff and just have it around. And a bunch of us will have keys to the place. And if you stick your nose in there and see that the toilet paper is gone, you can always put another roll on. I, you know, we can take care of that. I. Okay. Um, but 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 um, it's part of the standard contract that the portalette supplier, uh, when they do their pump out and cleanings, uh, mm -hmm. re rejuvenate the paper supply. Okay. Okay. Good. Yep. Yeah. Nothing's worse than seeing a no. public bathroom and then not yeah. having the, the and right. And there aren't even any material. leaves in there to uh, you know to work with. So. <laughs> right. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Do we have any uh, comments from the public or would the board like to move the uh, the agreement that's in authorizing the chair to sign on behalf of the select board? Could we put that up, uh, put the, uh, the pledge agreement up? Yep. I, I will say that Deborah told me she has signed it. She's mailed it from Calgary. Uh, it has not arrived yet. So we should be the authorization when it arrives to sign. I trust everybody's had the opportunity to read the the uh, uh, pledge letter. <laughs> Doug, what is all that stuff? <laughs> That's the road business. Yeah. Uh, Erosion. Oh, okay. <laughs> you, you don't recognize your drawing? <laughs> <laughs> doesn't look like my hand. All right, here's our, our pledge contract. Uh, I don't currently see any comment from the public, but uh, if anybody does have questions, reminder again uh, to raise your hand, uh, either on camera or using the uh, raise hand button under the participants tab. All right, Scott. Yeah, I just wanted to thank um, the Alexander family and Doug and Howard for stepping up to get this thing moving. I think it's gonna be a, a really wonderful asset for our community. So um, thank you so much. Welcome. Thanks, yeah. Scott. If there's no other public comment, I'll make a motion. And your motion is to approve the pledge agreement as presented, and authorizing the chair to sign. You read my mind. Yeah. <laughs> we have a second. Second. A second. Uh, uh, would you, uh, who made that motion? Uh, Nat, Nat did. Why don't you change that to Doug? Authorize Doug to sign it. That would be a very appropriate. Friendly amendment. And the seconder? Yes. Okay. Any other discussion? And there's none from the uh, general public? I'm not seeing any, no. Okay. What's the board? The boards must be pleasure was to vote. So all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Awesome. Thank awesome. you, Doug, for all your work. Howard, for all your work. Thank you, Doug. Yes. Thank you, Nat, for changing it. I'd like to thank the rest of our committee who, who worked hard and provided wonderful, wonderful input into it. Um, and I'm certain we'll be in contact with the village because this will be important to them also. And it will involve electrification of our uh, that site. Yep. I do now have a comment from the public. Okay, go ahead. 
Okay, um, my comment. Thanks. My comment is just I would encourage um, I'm not sure who, but everyone actually to put things on Google Maps. Like when we are naming the new Ted Alexander Welcome Center, we should plug it into Google Maps or whatever other maps allow you to put um, places so that we have lots of places in Johnson and the names of those places are known. I've done that in a number of uh, cases. If you look on Google Maps, you'll see my name on it. Um, but I think we we can and should do a better job collectively as a community in identifying those locations. Thanks. Thank you, Beth. Yeah. Good point. Very good point. Yep. Is there anyone else? If no. not, thank you, Howard. And we'll move on to the certificate. Certificate of Highway Mileage. Yep. Uh, so the annual Certificate of Highway Mileage is up for renewal. Um, we didn't change classification of any roads. We didn't adopt or give up any roads. So it is uh, due for just being recertified for uh, next year. What's the board's pleasure? You just I, you need to vote to certify it, and then I'll make the submission uh, to the state. Make the motion we certify our roads for highway mileage. We have motion. Do we have a second? I'll okay. We have motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, signify saying aye. 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 Those opposed. Eyes have it. Beautification committee appointment. So, uh, Carrie Watson has attended, uh, she attended the last beautification committee meeting and had uh, uh, been somewhat present for a couple others uh, in the neighborhood of a uh, uh, computer of somebody attending th those meetings uh, and would like to join the committee. Okay, and this was a posted position. It's uh, it's been posted for a while. The the okay. beautification committee needs more members. What's board's pleasure? I move the board of point Kerry Watson to the beautification committee. We have motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have motion and second. Any discussion? I'll just say that she's she's going to be a great asset to the to committee, so I'm, I'm very excited about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The ayes have it. Congratulations. Uh, conservation Committee. Oh, with... Uh... Resignation. Yeah, uh, with great regret, uh, Eric Noose has submitted his resignation from the Conservation Committee. What's the board's pleasure? Accept or deny? Deny. Deny. <laughs> no, accept. Accept. Then he has more time. <laughs> Sorry. I would suggest a motion to accept and uh, sending our uh, congrat or appreciation. Uh, letter. So I moved. Got a motion. I'll second that. I got a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? And the ayes have it. Sheriff's communication budget report. You had 10 minutes on this. <laughs> so uh, I think this one will be relatively short. The sheriff's communication budget is up for review. Uh, he, the communication budget has an overall decrease of 6.46% uh, and the assessment to Johnson's decreasing by a little bit less than that. Uh, but we'll see our communication assessment decrease by 6.43%. How's that possible? Sorry, I mean, it's good, but mm -hmm. that's uh, no, I, I 
can't really explain that. Uh, I, I have not been able, we've not been able to have the meetings that we normally would have with Roger. So I am, yeah. I, I don't feel well versed enough to get into details about his budget. I'm mm -hmm. guessing maybe the retirement of a couple of long-term employees. Okay. I expect that, so. Um, For that big a jump. That uh, I know they had uh, a pretty significant insurance increase a year or two ago. So it could be other personnel issues of, of people taking different plans or. Uh, mm -hmm. Be nice if the overall budget went down that much. Hours? No, the their overall no. budget. This is just the communication budget of the sheriff's right. department. Correct. Right. I said it would be nice if the whole budget went down that much. I believe he has committed to holding the patrol at three percent. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how much did the county budget go up? I never saw that. Yeah, I'd be interested to know how that Hyde Park sewer allocation deal works with the various budgets, Is it how it's broken mm -hmm. down by county budget, sheriff's communication budget, sheriff's budget. I mean, yeah. how are we seeing, is it, is it hitting each of those pots or is it just hitting the county? It is going to be hitting each of those, but the county courthouse is going to be uh, the line share uh, if not the highest is going to be one of the highest i think they have a higher utility use than a number of the others mm -hmm. just the size of the building the number of people in it um i think their utilities are higher than the the sheriff's department i think the trustees said they shouldn't squat they were getting a good deal <laughs> that's a good question though not uh, uh, will we have an opportunity to talk to um roger before we get into our budget? We can invite him to attend a meeting. Might be good. No, Actually, like I think it'd be very good. Him for our, our January, I think it's our January 4th meeting. Yeah, that'd be a good time to start the budget. Yeah. Right. With our increase, our increase for the county, the not finalized county budget is $2,368, uh, which is going to be in the neighborhood of a little bit less than 10%. And the lion's share of the county budget, well, over 50% is paid by stove. So they're going to take the biggest hit for that yeah. water. Bill. Well, they can afford it. So we're seeing a $25,000 increase. Mm which is greater than our whole contribution. Oh. Wow. <laughs> Nat, is the, is the, is the um, financial advisory committee meeting yet with Roger? Has that started? Uh, nope. Uh, okay. We, um, last year, we, with the boards, with this board's um, approval, entered into an informal agreement of, 3% increases for three years. Uh, this being a, this would be the budget that we're about to craft would be the second year of that informal agreement. So with um, you know COVID, we, we have not uh, met in person and or in Zoom or anything else, but I did reach out to them and to that group and said, what are we doing? Are we sticking to this agreement? Are we doing something different? Um, and uh, we, we agreed we would stick to the 3%. Okay. Thanks. I was just curious. Yeah. No, good question. Um. Okay. Uh, so there would be no action on this. It would be simply slipping into our budget when we start building our budget. Yep. Okay. Uh, I see the next item is an executive session. Uh, before we go into executive session, did anybody have anything they wanted to bring up? I had added one item to the agenda I wanted to talk to them about for a few minutes. But I, 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 I'm sorry, Doug. 
I thought we needed to address whatever Jenna's promise needed for paperwork. Yes, we do. Thank you, Doug. We need to authorize someone, Brian your mice or myself to sign uh, acknowledgement to we know they've gone for the grant, correct? Yeah, I, I believe that that's, I believe that that's the terminology that they, they need it for. It's just really an acknowledgement. Uh, is that your signature or the chair's? I believe that I can sign it. Okay. Uh, I will recommend that the board maybe makes the motion along the lines of the, the appropriate designees to sign. Uh, just in case it comes back and does need chair, but I think that it's town representative, not. That sounds like a good way to to craft the motion. Yeah. What's the pleasure, the board? So move that. We have a motion. Do we have a second? second. A motion and second. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed. And the eyes have it. Oh, did you have something, Nat? Just another real quick topic, just to loop back to Kyle's question. I also um, just wanted to mention um, the Duncan's committee, Duncan and Diana, and you know that that three town committee on oh, law yeah. and affordability. Those those folks have hit the ground running, and uh, they're really digging in. And, and their their meeting minutes are available on um, on the town website. So. Um, I think that's the that's probably the most relevant answer to that question is that they're mm -hmm. really going to get into the budget really yeah. deep into, into that in the coverage and all that. So great, thank you. Yeah, that I'll look into that again. Thank you, Nat. Anyone else? Okay, uh, I just wanted to recap uh, some of the events that have happened over the last week. Some of my thoughts, anyhow. Uh, Gordy Smith resigned from the. Board of Trustees. He also resigned as the first emergency management coordinator position uh, for the town and the emergency management team. I asked Nat to take the first position and Scott to take the second position and they both accepted. We are not replacing Gordy on the, uh, the emergency management team uh, at this time because Basically, we're just monitoring the situation. There's not a lot of work going on right now. I did want to just say that uh, Gordy has served and put himself out there for the community for almost 50 years. Um, he was over 30 years the chief of the fire department. He saw many flood events and rescue events that he led a fire department to rescue these people. Uh, he did lead the fire department and all of the fire departments in the county when our uh, landmark was on fire, saving the rest of the village, as well as uh, thousands of other uh, events that he personally led as the chief. I would also uh, just mention that he was close to 20 years on the uh, trustee board and uh, while he and I had some battle royal fights and sometimes we were not on speaking terms, um, I did always respect him. I knew that he was fighting for what he felt was the best for the village as well as I was fighting for what I thought was best for the town. I've always held a huge amount of uh, respect for him, appreciated his wisdom and his contributions and the help that he's provided me with the, any of the emergencies that we've had to deal with. What's a little bit troubling for me is, is I think Johnson's in some dark times. I, I'm a little disheartened with the, the, the hate, uh, the, the division between our community, in our, inside our community, the uh, harassment, and uh, threats for public officials. Um, we can do better than that. Johnson is better than that. And I think right now uh, we have a trustee chair. I'm expecting Scott will be the chair. He's the only member of that board 
who was on there at the beginning of the year and everyone else is new. While Will was a former member, I'm sure he's still uh, taking some time to get caught up. What they need from us now is our support. Um, I have reached out to Scott and offered any help that I can. And when I say our support, I'm not just saying the select board, I think the whole community needs to help and support Scott. He's gonna be leading a team of all green board members. Uh, they have a lot of work ahead of them. They have a lot of important things they have to deal with. And on top of they're gonna be going into their budget season. And I think it's time for the town and the community to come back together and work to help and uh, support the trustees. Um, they're they're going to need it. And I have my hats off to Scott because I'm sure he's going to take the chair position. Um, that's a huge, huge task. And uh, I think we as a community need to come together. And those are just some of my thoughts that I wanted to share from the last week. With that, uh, I guess I would entertain a motion to enter into executive session to discuss employee evaluation. Eric. Mike. Are we gonna talk about any general information items or budget items or, or any of this stuff or the, were these numbers uh, from these various groups the same as they were last year? Are we gonna come back to any of this stuff after mm -hmm. the executive session? Or should we talk about some of it now? What are you referring to, a budget? Well, we got general information uh, stuff here. Is there anything that we should talk about? Oh, uh, uh, I guess I'll yield to Brian if there was anything in there. I hadn't noticed anything. Those are all items that would be talked about when we discuss the budget. Yeah, the, right, the but, budget items are, are um, yeah, are going to be there when we get into our, our regular budget. Uh, I don't believe that there are going to be any Right, so far right now, I don't think we have anybody requesting changes for from their budget item for last year. Uh, for other pieces of information, um, the healthy level, the, the one I'd, I'd highlight, I guess I'd highlight too, the Sterling Snow Riders Snowmobile Club uh, letter to Mr. and Mrs. Lanfear that they are uh, working to, to get trail access back on their property. Um, and they asked, you know, uh, just that we kind of are aware of what's going on, uh, that the landfears were having a problem with uh, noise violations that were unrelated to the snowmobiles, uh, but they became frustrated and are kind of closing their, their property for other uses. Uh, so that is relevant to us in general because of the noise violations, um, which we encourage the Sheriff's Department uh, to enforce our adopted uh, noise policy. Um, excuse me, our noise ordinance, not a policy. Uh, and the Health of the Moyle Valley Planning Toolkit, uh, they've done a lot of terrific work with that. And uh, that is available on their website for review and for uh, use for anybody that Needs us, and they did a really nice job, kind of putting together a, a very well polished uh, a guide for uh, substance misuse with youth. I just, I guess, I would advise you, Mike, if there's something you want to discuss, we should discuss it before we go into executive session. I did not anticipate we would take any action out side of uh, when we finish executive right. session. Right. I just saw some of these. Uh, information items and I thought maybe uh, something we ought to know about, maybe something the public ought to know about because probably after we finish with our executive session, most everybody will have tuned off. Okay. Well, is there any item there that you or anyone else would like to discuss before we do enter into executive session? I'm not seeing anything. Uh, with that, I would entertain a motion to enter into executive session. I move that we uh, 
go into executive session to discuss employee evaluation as allowed by 1 VSA 313A3 for 15 minutes. Exactly. We got a motion. We got a, do we have a second? I'll second. We have a motion and second. Any discussion? Take that 15 minutes off, by the way. <laughs> I'm yeah, assuming please. you meant not more than 15 minutes. Okay. <laughs> Any other discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, the eyes have it. Show us in executive session at 920. Hey, make a motion we adjourn and say Merry Christmas to everybody. Yeah, for the year adjourn. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Motion in a second. All those in favor signify saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, show us adjourned. Mm -hmm.